thanks everyone for joining us today for our threat hunting workshop. Uh, my name is Vicente Diaz. I work as threat intel and um, strategist in virus total team uh, in, in Google. And today uh, we are going to go for this workshop. Uh, basically what we want to do is explore some ideas that they feel like they are interesting and useful when we are doing threat hunting. And we will also be using some real examples and see how we can uh, work with them. Um, so hopefully this is useful for everyone. Uh, most of the time we are going to be using virus total just because it's more convenient for me and we have most of the stuff already implemented there. But obviously some of these ideas can be applied for any other platform with similar characteristics. All right, so as, um, as we have discussed, uh, please drop any questions in the Q&A. Um, from time to time, I will simply go and check if there is something there that we want to take a look. Just to make sure that nobody gets lost or everything is clear. And you know, sometimes it's better just to stop at the time and check if, one, if we can clarify something before moving on. Uh, we will be making some break. Uh, more or less in the middle of the session, just yes, for everybody to you know have this bio break. And I think this is more or less this. So let's get started. Um, so the first thing I, I want to say is to quickly introduce uh, what is virus total in case that you're not familiar with it and why I feel this is relevant for the session we are doing. Once again, uh, this is a threat hunting session. So we want to understand what are the techniques that nowadays, uh, well, I, I was working, just say a little bit more about myself for the last 10 years in Kaspersky Global Research and Analysis Team. And basically this kind of threat hunting is what we were doing all the time. And here I just want to well, share some of the ideas. And what, one of the important things that you need is access to some large database uh, and obviously we always have partial visibility of the threats. So, so we need somewhere to look for something that could be related to what we are analyzing at the moment, right? Trying to get like the full picture. So, well, in Biosota, you can find, I don't know how much data, like here we have in this infographic, like 2.4 billion files. Uh, I think we did this like a couple of years ago, because here it says it's 15 years, it should be now close to 17. And well, we have a lot of telemetry from all around the world, which is interesting, yes, because um, it's, very, um, it's very rich from many different sources. Um, so when we do threat hunting, we want to have access to something like that. Uh, obviously it could be just inside your organization, but uh, you know, it really helps having everything organized, especially when we are going after cyber criminals or IPT groups that they have most likely acted somewhere else. Um, and we can just, you know, put everything in the same picture. So basically uh, why we are doing threat hunting, this is like one question I think, well, we can go very quickly, but basically when we are in this threat hunting process, we want to get as much visibility as possible of some malicious activity. Um, obviously, it depends what you're investigating. Uh, for instance, back in the days in Kaspersky, we were investigating like APT groups. So we were following them, we were monitoring, and every time we find some clue, well, we wanted to have like uh, these big repositories where we would be like, you know, throwing our nets and trying to get everything that could be related. And then from this subgroup, subset of uh, stuff that we find, we will be trying to find something else. Um, but when we are doing hunting, maybe we don't know what we are looking for. Maybe we are simply trying to find something uh, original. Uh, this, for instance, is something we do with Yara rules. We will be talking about Yara rules later in the training. Um, but Yara rules are like very useful for finding anomalies. And sometimes you really don't know what you're looking for, but you're just trying to find something that doesn't make sense. Uh, this is another technique for threat hunting in case that you just want to find something new that you've never seen before. But most of the time, it comes out of some forensic analysis, incident response, we have a few artifacts and we want to get a bigger picture. And then it depends how deep we want to, to dig 
into, into the analysis. Sometimes we just want to have a brief idea. This is related to this set of activity act or whatever. Um, some other time, uh, we really need to find absolutely everything related to this for whatever the reason. So yeah, and th these are like typical scenarios when we're using threat hunting. So a couple of things I want just to say from the very beginning, uh, because I feel this is important to, to consider. Uh, I always talk about this partial visibility. It doesn't matter how big is your database, nobody has perfect visibility of a threat. And sometimes this leads to contradictions, like uh, different actors or uh, let's say different researchers or different uh, vendors, they have like their own version of uh, different APT groups, depending on what is their visibility. It doesn't mean they are not right. It just simply means sometimes that well, they are interpreting based on the data they have. So we need to keep an open mind to this. Um, this happens also a lot with this echoing effect. Like uh, if somebody sees something from some group and creates a yard rule, for instance, then uh, this keeps resonating over and over. Uh, if there is any mistake in this first attribution, then basically we do this snowball effect. So it doesn't hurt always to double check and to make sure what were the circumstances where some jar rule, for instance, was created and why this was attributed to this or that particular actor, depending how important it is for you, obviously attribution, but this happens all the time. Like at some point, like some vendor is making this analysis and they find this group of uh, artifacts related to some set of activity and they attribute this to some actor. And this is perfectly fine. But let's say that these same uh, artifacts are later being used by some other actor. And at some point they became like, I don't know, mainstream. And there are like five actors using the same artifacts. Still the same YAR rule will fire and will make the attribution to the first group. But now it's different groups who are using that. So we need to keep refreshing. We need to keep you know, uh, our hunting very alive not just something static we throw and we forget about that. We need to make this effort if we want this to be effective. Um, so that's why we need all this context all the time. And this is all really important. We really need to understand if we want to be a good analyst or not just you know, uh, find random stuff. And finally, uh, before we start like with something more practical, uh, I want to stress how important it is to have this continuous monitoring of these different threats. Like sometimes uh, there is some publication and from there we get the IOCs, maybe some JAR rules, whatever. And we, we stop doing anything else afterwards. Like, yeah, this campaign, it was these IOCs and that's it. Uh, just because there is no further publications around this. Um, it doesn't mean that campaign is over. And many times, uh, I've I seen that many times that I, from an analyst point of view, they stop here, the analysis. But yeah, these are the IOCs from this campaign. But the campaign obviously keeps evolving. Again, visibility is limited. So maybe new uh, visibility is available just because new victims are sharing some data, etc. And we need to keep an eye on top of the campaign uh, all the time that this campaign is active. So my recommendation also is everything that is something new, well, let's create our monitoring. Let's create like some way to be on top of this. And it doesn't necessarily mean we need to, uh, I don't know, ingest every single IOC or something like that, but we want to keep an eye on this. And this is important that every time there is something new, we need to open this new monitoring and keep an eye to see how things are evolving. And basically at the end of the day, if we want to avoid some of these attacks, I think this is the best method. Uh, I mean, if there is like a new actor and he's creating something absolutely new that nobody was prepared and using zero days, well, uh, obviously being protected from that is tricky. But if there is some actor acting today and we are not the very first victims, but we keep monitoring, we keep seeing how they evolve. And every time there is something new, we make sure we are protected against that. 
our chances are improving very much. So, uh, it, and this is not only from the protection point of view, it's also from the hunting point of view. Um, the campaigns can evolve, and especially after a publication, attackers can change their TTPs, they can change their infrastructure, they can change their malware. So we need to keep an eye on this as well and see if there is any reaction to make sure that we are uh, understanding everything that everything new that comes this way. Okay, so that was just a few notes I wanted to to share with you in terms of uh, more, uh, let's say, general uh, analyst point of view. And then I, I want to start discussing some of these techniques, uh, threat handling techniques, and how to use them. And we will start with something like uh, more simple stuff and then start uh, finding something more complicated, more advanced. So one of the first things we do as analysts, when we get something new, we try to find what is unique about this, what is there in the, from this group of samples that is common and that we haven't seen before. And most of the time, uh, this comes in the form of strings. Uh, sometimes, well, strings could be anything. It could be a sequence of bytes, right? But um, here, what I say is that we have an atomic piece of information where we have something and we want to understand what is this and how uh, unique this is in order to find other stuff that is related to this. So let's see how we do this kind of stuff uh, with, in this case, our total. And we will start with the best case scenario when the community already did everything for us. So this is something we find many times that we start our investigation and already we find information about this. So what I will do now is just to share the screen like this. Let's go to virus total and we will take a look. So here I already have some searches uh, for this uh, to show you with some examples. So what is what is in virus total is that here we have um, all this crowdsource uh, data, crowdsource intelligence from the community, and this can help us just to understand what is some threat. And um, this has good and bad things, like what we were discussing before. This echoing chamber effect is something is wrong from the beginning. Obviously, um, then we can get into trouble. But most of the time, this can give us like uh, very very good details. No? So for instance, this is some uh, random search, to be honest. Um, but we already see here that we have some cross-source stuff, meaning that there are like some general rules and similar rules that are detonating. Not only that, we have also some detection from the sandbox. And then we have all the data from the antiviruses. So what is this? We also have all these tags giving us some information. So. When we find ourselves in this position, uh, we already have a lot of information to digest. So we can see that something is suspicious, XOR, uh, probably an URL. This is from Florian Roth. And then we have some suspicious Ranky uh, from download and some modifications in how to run. And then this is flag as malware by the sandbox, which is pretty obvious as because we see a lot of antiviruses are also detecting this as malware. And here we also see that there is some uh, anti sandbox techniques like check network adapters, uh, CPU clock access, long sleeves, has some overlay, is the PXE, uh, some techniques for persistence, some runtime modules, and is compressed with UPX. In this case, we don't have any comments from the community. But we already have a lot of information about this sample, uh, why this is suspicious. And actually, we can actively search for things like that. Like uh, here we have like some interesting uh, modifiers for the searches. Uh, having all this information, we can use things like that. Uh, here I just copy paste everything. This is the number of positives, more than five, less than 25. And having crowdsource JAR rules like we have seen here, see my rules as well, and also comments from the community. So let's try to search here, like something that is already digested by someone else. And then it's up for us to trust or not. Uh, obviously, it also depends on the source. Um, it's interesting that in some cases, there are some samples that basically match almost everything, which 
uh, is interesting. But here um, we have some suspicious let name confuser. Well, we can see the rule set, and this is something that probably we should be doing to start with. So we can see who is the author, and we can see how strong is this JAR rule or not. And also from these JAR rules, we can simply jump into other files that are detected by the JAR rules at cells. Uh, so here there's a lot of information. What, what is interesting also that we have the comments from the community. Uh, some of them are automatic like these ones. Let's find something with more comments. Uh, I don't know. Let's try here. A couple of comments from the community. Well, these are from the standard rules. Um, maybe here we have three of them. Joy Sandbox. Uh, well, this is reported by these uh, small issues. Well, in some cases, um, and here we also have the R rules. This is detonating. So we usually, um, when we talk about enrichment and we, when we talk about hunting, this is like the easiest layer. Like we can start simply by checking uh, what the community is saying. And from here, we can pivot, like as we saw from some R rule, like some suspicious PowerShell combo and we can go and find other files related to this and see uh, how common this is, how many files uh, we find, uh, if they really look like they are related or not, etc. In this case, this is pretty common, like 91K files using this kind of technique. But this is how we can start quickly piloting, simply using what we already know, what the community already shared, which uh, if you're not working, let's say in Biostata, you're working in your company, and you have your own yard rules and you have your own colleagues working in this direction, probably it's the same. You will simply go here and check like what other stuff is detected under these rules uh, that we have for monitoring. In this case, we are simply uh, taking advantage that we have a lot of information from the community. So, well, it could be community is doing everything for us, right? Um, so what we can do and here is um, something that is, as I said, very common, is search for something inside of the content that can be interesting. So basically here in various total, you can search for anything. Uh, let's say we go into this main file, or we can go into, oh, sorry, inside of the content. And inside of the content, um, which is not displaying, I don't know why. Okay, let me try a second file. Uh, you can simply search for anything here and what is related. Um, let's say we find inside of these strings something suspicious, which actually could be anything. Just let me clarify that we can go into the details and uh, here maybe the signature itself, this store operation and install deployment exe from vehicle hiring system is something we can simply click and search if we find this in the signature, right? But, well, uh, sorry. Uh, actually, this is 48 files, so maybe they are related, maybe they are not. But basically, inside of the content, uh, we will find for stuff that is not indexed by any of the tools that are extracting this information. So it's like a grep. Uh, when we use a grep, we are searching for something inside of the core of the malware itself, inside of the executable. And here, well, this looks like most of the, the stuff is compressed or something. And then there are like some libraries. So it doesn't sound like super interesting, anything here. But anyways, just for the sake of showing how it works, we will simply select some of these strings and we will search for them. Maybe this imimimim. And here you can see that automatically is using this content modifier. So basically the content modifier is translating this into X and that's why this is the 6960 for this I am, I am, I am, I am. But then it's looking inside of the files if this is something that is malicious or not, is for us to decide. But you can see all the CS Studio, for instance, files 
uh, found by this search, they look like probably the same. They have like similar file size uh, and everything. So in this case, this string in particular is useful to find um, to find this family of stuff, which we don't know if it is malicious or not. But anyways, uh, this is the content modifier, and the content modifier is helping us to find uh, anything inside of the files, which, uh, as I said, sometimes when we are analyzing some file, it could be very relevant, especially things like a PDB or things like that. So uh, how this is implemented, if you are curious, uh, it's an index of 32-bit substrings. And basically, uh, well, you are using this index to find any of these substrings very quickly. Uh, but here we have like some example. Um, in this case, we can use this sample from TrickBot. And here we will see uh, a clearer way to find something useful. Um, so we go to the content. And what is interesting is that this TrickBot sample, if I'm not mistaken, yes, it has like this PDB. So this is one of the most interesting stuff uh, that we can find uh, in any file that we are investigating, because this is telling us about the path where the project uh, was saved. And this is pretty unique. So let's say that, well, we want to find more samples. We can simply go for the content here. Uh, here we are finding nothing, uh, which is not good. Um, I think it's because we need to escape. Uh, let me one sec and check in my notes. I think we need simply to escape this um, because the search itself. Let me try to do something different. Let me try to do like this. And then we can put the string, but if I'm not mistaken, we need to escape it. Just let me do it real quick. Well, not working. We cut escaping. Not good. Maybe we can try to find some part of the path. Uh, here is complaining because it's not escaping. See this one? No. Well, it was not very good demo here. I think the problem is that this slide, I didn't refresh and now I cannot find, these samples are indexed uh, back in the past. That's why it's not finding anything here now. But well, anyways, um, now I'm curious if it is the same file I was using, just let me check real quick. It was this one, I think. This trick pot. Well, let's try to find another example. So in this case, uh, we were looking for this PDB, which we were not able to find anything, uh, unfortunately. Uh, maybe if we simply search for this. Yeah, there are like 17. No, so this is indexed in a different way uh, because the PDBs, I know that they are automatically extracted because this is something interesting by default. So we can search like that. But with the content modifier, it didn't work, uh, unfortunately. I'm not sure why. Anyways, what is important here is to find some relevant strings. 
like PDBs, as we said, but also things like encryption keys or the comments. Like in many bots, they are having the same comments like uh, when receiving, etc. Especially if there is something particular about them, like there is some typo or something like this, then this is very good because this way we can find something different, uh, something unique, I mean. So here we have a second example. Um, in this case, uh, this is what we were looking for. Uh, maybe my bad was to put the double quote. No, 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 I think it's just because this is not indexed. Well, but we saw how it works. Unfortunately, I didn't refresh this. But basically, let me show you with the screenshots here. Uh, we are like searching for the content. Uh, here is escaping. Uh -huh. yes, I, I will do my last try if that was my problem. But I think that simply it's out of the window of uh, yes, it's out of the window of indexing of my account. That's why we are not finding anything else. But yeah, this is useful because uh, simply you can escape like some parts with uh, these question marks. So let's say we don't know if it is in the D unit, in the C unit or whatever. So we can simply go for it and put the question marks. And then with the content modifier, we will replace this with anything, which is giving us some flexibility. And this is helping us to find uh, like making this more flexible to find more stuff that is related to this family in case that we find some interesting uh, string like the PDBs. So, so this is what I wanted to say, and this is what we already saw, uh, that what happens when we don't use the content modifier. And the thing is that internally, if you're interested, uh, we have like different uh, indexes. And if this information was extracted with any of the tools, then it will show up. Um, but if it was not, then we need to use a content modifier because we are simply searching inside of the files, as I said, uh, just because we are using this grep functionality. But in some cases, like a PDB, uh, this is extracted by some of the tools, so we can simply use it uh, to find it. All right. Um, another thing is that with the content modifier, this is something interesting that not everybody is aware, is that you can combine this with other modifiers too. Uh, for instance, if you are searching for some unique uh, stuff in the content, you can combine with size, type, first thing, last theme, in hash, number of positives, any tag, and also submissions. And actually, this was recently something that uh, some of our users were discussing with us, like, it will be cool if we can combine the content modifier with something else, which is possible. So in case that you are not aware, I just wanted to share with you, it is, but it's something that not everybody is aware. All right, so these are like very simple, um, these are like very simple um, searches. Like we find something, some string that we find this is relevant. So we need to have some way to find this in a bigger collection. It should be indexed. It should be some way for us for us to search into that in a quick way. This is a first approach. Uh, actually, we can simply get this string. If we are sure it is good enough, we can put it in a YAR rule, for instance, and, uh, and work with that. But what happens when uh, we want to search for something, but we cannot really find this unique string. We cannot really find something that appears in other samples. For instance, if the IOC, IOCs are unique, like there are some changes, or if it is not possible for searching using um, uh, by, by strings, right? But we still need this context. So what can we do? And here we have similarity. Similarity is uh, one of the techniques that a few years ago was not that much available, to be honest, uh, when we were doing this hunting. But these days it is. These days there are like many different ways to use similarity. So yes, to understand what is the, the idea behind is that yes, you can create like different IOCs, but uh, if you are like coding the malware, well, 
uh, your possibilities are limited. You don't have that many possibilities. Um, you will be reusing some code. You will be reusing some libraries. You will be uh, using, I don't know, some protocols that are uh, applied for all the malware that is implemented. You are working with the same team and you also have some habits uh, to make some kind of decisions when you are programming. So all of these, at the end of the day, it results that uh, different stuff that is being uh, implemented by the same team is very likely that it has some commonalities with some other stuff. So this is helping us at the end of the day of making the decision like, well, we cannot find anything really uh, in this malware in order to find other stuff, but we can find some similar stuff. We can find some similar samples. Um, this is in reality how, well, a lot of attribution is made these days. And this is how, well, uh, it's a technique that it doesn't hard to use just to see if what you find looks like it is related, if, if it makes any sense. So if something is similar, it doesn't necessarily mean it is related, but it means that you want to take a second look. It means that maybe there is something there that is not so obvious and maybe it could be the key for an investigation. So in terms of similarity, you have many, many, many different algorithms and there are different techniques and it really depends if you want to, I don't know, um, depends on the kind of malware, depends on the kind of artifact and different similarities. They are useful at different times. Uh, so let's go for one example I have here. Uh, in this case, this sample. All right, so here we have a lot of community comments, which is some severity malware. Uh, severity is related to sophacy. So here we have uh, actually all of these are different similarity methods that we can use. Uh, we can simply launch all of them if we want, but let me simply describe a little bit. Um, so SSD probably is the most well known by everyone along with imhash. Both are basically um, static to the sample and they try to add some fuzzing in order to understand if there is some uh, in this case, some similar stuff. Imhash is just based on the imports of the sample. It creates a hash. And well, if you are assuming here that, for instance, for polymorphic malware, it will be always using the same imports. Uh, you can search by code blocks that look similar. Uh, and then you also have like different sandboxes, which is behavioral um, similarity, as we will see later. And then we have this BT feature hash and well, TL TLSH which is also uh, publicly available. And we, we will use, in this case, this VT feature hash, which is something that was created in-house. But um, and here you can see that you can find very quickly three different files, like two of them are new. And looking at the size, they look like the same. Um, they were first seen around more or less the same time. So it looks likely they could be related. Uh, actually, we can search for commonalities. And well, the hash, obviously they have the same, but also they have the same in hash, same number of sections. And this is interesting, the compilation time stamp, which is obviously fake, uh, is common in two of them, as well as the entry point, as well as the, uh, imports and section names. So looks like pretty similar, but obviously then we will need to, we will need to go and analyze if they are the same or not. Um, there are other similarity techniques that maybe are less well known, but I think they are extremely interesting in some scenarios. So uh, let me go for this sample. And here, what we have, uh, I, I just showed you, we have all these kind of similarities. There is another kind of similarity we have, which is called visual similarity. So 
visual similarity is not um is, is this one icon thumbnail uh but actually you can simply go here and click in, in this case this is some trick bot that they were using this icon um this way you can simply click and find a lot of samples that it, it may be related maybe they are not but uh, as you can see here all oh, this group they have like the same size um well it's something to to analyze obviously but it's a quick way to find it like all these groups of uh, malware that are using something visually uh, similar and there is even a better example the second one uh just let me show you oh wait i will open here um, so what happens with visual similarity in the case that uh, the previous case was about the icon, but in some cases, some artifacts like this one, this is a PDF and this is a malicious PDF that was sent um, to some victims. So in many cases, this same template uh, is being used to different uh, victims. So this one is for Citibank, like you have a suspended account, click here, well, typical uh, phishing scam. So we click to find something similar. And here we find like many other files that look like the same. Uh, previous one was from Citibank and here we, we see like Wells Fargo, for instance. Um, probably it is the same, yes, let's check. Yeah, same, but Wells Fargo, North America. Uh, also, this TD Bank here. I guess same stuff. Right. So, this can be useful also in more sophisticated attacks. I mean, obviously, this can be for any campaign that is propagating through mail in a massive way, let's say some kind of ransomware or some kind of fraud. But even for more APT related attacks, where uh, actually, you can do the other way around. And if you know some interesting document that could be in, uh, being used in order to lure the victims, uh, you can actually search for it if there is something similar, which is another way to find. Uh, let's say that there are some paperwork these days that um, are, well, we have seen that many times with some uh, APT groups that uh, they were like going into some military websites and stealing the journals or some PDFs and just changing them in order to look like they were coming from this website, right? Um, so this kind of stuff that where they are using some official materials and just putting some malicious payloads, some macros, whatever. Uh, this is also a good method to monitor if you find something that looks like that and it's being distributed in a malicious way. Um, so how to calculate similarity? Uh, we discussed like different methods. Uh, actually here, I wanted to show you what, uh, well, I, I just showed you a second ago uh, when we were seeing all these different methods. I want to show you how it works uh, in terms of behavioral, um, behavioral um, similarity. Because sometimes uh, this is something that the sandbox can help us with. Um, wait a second. Uh, so this is Palo Alto. I don't know if you're familiar with the playbooks. I think that they are very, very interesting because they have all these playbooks with the TTPs from different attackers. And here I selected this one because here uh, we have some interesting entry. Uh, so, you know, here we have the TTPs but uh, they are also providing some technical details in some cases, which is very, very interesting. So yes, uh, let me see, uh, where is it? I think it was here, yes. No, this is PowerShell, register run, startup. Okay, so they are using this registry key. Uh, I just not sure where it was. Just let me check my notes. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's six and text encoding. I think it was this one, right? That we were saying here. So this is the PowerShell they're executing. Sorry, not this one. Um, 
Yes. So they create this entry in system, text, and coding. So we are seeing here, let's say we're analyzing this Palo Alto publication, like how they are using their uh, TTPs, the attackers in this case, Muddy Water. And we saw this entry. So of course we can go and search for it uh, into virus total and see if we find any files that are using this technique, right? And actually we find a few ones. Uh, you can see that three of them are this company information list dot uh, doc. And then we have two binary files here. So from here, uh, we can go to this sample. Is one of those, this company information list dot doc. And actually, what we can go is into behavior. And inside of behavior, well, we have like, uh, different possibilities. Here we have like different um, sandboxes because everything is detonated in different sandboxes. So here's the interesting thing is that in some cases, uh, the sandbox is offering us with the possibility to search for similarity based on the behavior. So here we can just go and search for similar behavior based on this sandbox. And uh, here we find a file that we didn't find before. So it's also more or less the same time for um, I, don't, I don't really know if this is related or not. Let's see in the community. Yeah, muddy water. So this is another way of finding similarity. In this case, it's not based in how it looks like visually. It doesn't uh, rely on, let's say, the structure of the sample, but it relies on how it behaves, which could be very interesting. So this is another possibility we can use in terms of similarity. Um, so additionally, we can also find uh, this similar to, which is one of the techniques we use here. Uh, this is the behash. Let, let me just quickly close some of these windows. Uh, similar to is this BT feature hash. Uh, this is similar to. So other than this, uh, we can also go and sorry, we can also go and use different uh, filters. So for instance, we can use half, which is telling us like uh, we want to have some in the wild detections. Uh, we want this to be distributed like an attachment. We want this to be having some compressed parents. So we know how it was being distributed. We want this to have some comments. So we can leverage some of this crowdsource intelligence, or we want this to have some behavior network. Um, so all these modifiers are uh, in, uh, in addition to this similarity is helping us to very quickly filter like uh, what we want. So here we have like, for instance, this example. So this is this file. If I'm not mistaken, this is some tripod, right? Yeah. So we have this tripod thingy. And if we go to similarity, well, it says more than 20, but actually, I think this is a huge number. Uh, let's say in this case, we simply want to filter because we are interested in the infrastructure. And this is massive because Tripod is like, you know, um, a huge number of samples we can find. So in this case, we can simply understand more about the infrastructure that Tripod is using. And what we are doing is using this behavior network. So this way we know that the samples at some point, they, they were communicating. Um, from here, we can extract the infrastructure. So this is the way we have to filter a little bit better, like uh, all this big amount of data. Um, I was thinking that I will quickly take a look into the chat if there is any comment or any question or something. And then we can do a break, because I think it's been like 45 minutes. So let me quickly check. We have Q&A, okay, and questions. We have the chat. Good morning, all right. 
Good morning, everyone. Sorry uh, if I didn't say that uh, for me the evening. But I think in that case, we can take a quick break. Uh, now it's 47. Let's go back at 57. So 10 minutes break, if everyone is fine with that. And then we continue so we can stretch a bit and drink some water. OK, so let's get back in 10 minutes. All right, so I think we are ready to go. Um, so before we start, um, there was a question in the Q&A, which is how much of all the features you've shown require a pest description? Um, I think that um, to, 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 to. So, for instance, everything that is displaying information, I think it does not require a uh, subscription. But like these searches with it, I think they do. Um, similarity, I'm not sure. Probably you need. Um, so I'm not going to lie. I, I think that most of the stuff probably you require the subscription. But I'm not sure. We can, we can actually check later if you want. Well, anyways, so let's continue with the session. Uh, last thing we were discussing was uh, similarity. And now uh, let's go for another chapter. Uh, so let me share my screen once again, which is finding related artifacts and infrastructure. This is quick. Uh, so basically here, uh, what we want to do is check once that we find all these artifacts and everything, if we can find some infrastructure. Infrastructure is also a great resource in many cases because this way we can understand how things are being distributed and if there is like some common nexus. I would say that these days is not like in the past where it was very clear where we have this CNC and everything was going there and things like that. And from there we can pivot and find many other artifacts that are related. I think that these days is everything a little bit different but it still is uh, obviously very important to understand uh, what is the infrastructure that is being used. And so we can do this in many different ways. And this is something that we can find by default in most of the cases. So let's go for the example, for instance. And you can see that we have different tabs. One of them is relations. Relations is how this is related to anything else in the world, like uh, what else uh, we, we find is interacting with the sample in particular. So for instance, we have this URL that this malware is contacting, which is interesting for us. Also, we have the IP addresses. And also we find these embed domains. In this case, gmail.com is in, inside that. And we see this is in some graphs related to Emotet. And we can see this summary of the graph. Actually, uh, I think we can click here. This is something we will see later in a bit more detail, like how these graphs work. But basically, this is what we were seeing there, this summary. Oops, still was um, developing. Now, we have this root node. Um, let me just make it a bit clearer like out of here. We have this root node that we were investigating. And from here, we see we have this embed domain, gmail.com. And then we see different IPs. And actually, they are in this red circle because they are considered as malicious by different vendors. So probably these IPs, we can also uh, further um, expand and find more interesting stuff. And also, this URL is malicious, the one we already saw. And here you see the similarity. Then we will discuss a, bit, a little bit more about the graph in the sense of having these visual investigations. I think that some cases, uh, this is making life much easier. Yes, if you have the possibility to drop everything in this chart, in this graph, and, and you can see how it is interacting with anything else. So here we see that uh, similar to this sample, we, we, we find a bunch of other samples and this one is communicating here. Um, so what we can do here, for instance, uh, these IPs, 
I'm curious why uh, these IPs are um, malicious. So we can go for full expansion. Let's see if this works. Right. So from here, uh, we already see that the relationship is this um, communicating files. So all these files are communicating to this IP. And at the same time, we have these URLs that are all malicious. You can see they have this random path, right? So, well, with a couple of clicks here, anyways, uh, we can find interesting infrastructure. In this case, this is one of the IPs, but we have three other IPs, and we can also see uh, what kind of stuff they have. Let's do this one, for instance, just out of curiosity. And, well, this way, uh, we, we understand the infrastructure that is related in this case. So. If all these samples were to be related, oh, we have a document, maybe this is a dropper or something. These are all these URLs that are also random. So we see the same pattern. It's an IP with a random URL inside. And the files that are communicating, may they are similar. Uh, we see emotet and then file name. So probably this is all emotet stuff. Uh, well, we can check this. But anyways, uh, the infrastructure very quickly um, develops and is providing us a lot of valuable information. Um, so again, this information comes, as we said, uh, from inside the binary itself, like embed domains. This is something we find inside of the binary, but also because of the sandbox. So that's why it's very important to have like uh, this possibility to detonate in this dynamic analysis environment. So we see how the sample is behaving. Yeah. And in this case, uh, we have another interesting sample here. Let's go check it. And this is. I'm not sure this was emoted as well. Let me kill this graph. Let's create a graph around this sample. Uh, in the meantime, we can take a look into relations. So, okay, what is interesting about this one is that we have a lot of in the wild URLs, domains, and addresses, which means that uh, we found this was distributed through these uh, IPs and domains and URLs. And this is very useful because from here we can quickly pivot and see if anything else was distributed through there. And then it's contacting some URLs. Um, well, we can see this IP here and here. Threat Analyst Handbook, interesting. So it's contacting all these. But let's see how it looks in the graph. Oh, wait a second. I probably moved this further, which I shouldn't, but oh, it doesn't matter. So here's all the contacted IPs, as we saw. But here is the most interesting, um, how it was being distributed. We have the domains, the URLs, uh, these are contacted. But I want to see how it was being distributed. The distribution vector. Uh, here are the files that this drop. So this is a dropper, which is dropping some stuff here. Emoted. So this is a dropper of emoted. And these are the different URLs where it was being distributed. So. Let's take a look into these domains, for instance, and see what else is being distributed from here. Uh, let's expand this one. So we can quickly find three other documents, probably similar to this one, which maybe are also distributed in Emotet. 
Um, let's take a look. It's getting a bit messy. Eh? Wait a sec. We'll just move a bit. And what I want to see if, yes, this is dropping something. It, it, and this is also a method. So, well, you can you can play here a bit around and you can uh, find more infrastructure. But basically, you see we have different methods. The first one is if we find something inside of the binary itself, uh, we can recognize as a domain like this Gmail we saw before, which um, this is, well, this is useful, but I think this is probably the less relevant. The second uh, is if it is communicating to anything. And probably this is the second most relevant because here we can see part of the infrastructure. But at the same time, sometimes they are communicating to some domain URL just to see if they have the internet connection. So we need to be a bit careful with that. And the third one, the third method is if this is being seen, distributed through some URL or domain. And this is the most interesting one because this way we can find uh, other part of the infrastructure or other samples that are related to the same campaign. So pivoting through the infrastructure, I think the most interesting is when it is being distributed in the wild. Unfortunately, uh, in this case, when it was communicating, they are using, you can see um, this random path in the URL. And this is unfortunate because many times we find that this is not the case. Uh, we find that it's not really a random path. Like you see this one, this WordPress probably was hack or something. This includes, and um, here we have this TH uh, T8TF, uh, right? Um, if this wouldn't be random, we could be use we could use that to find more related infrastructure using the same uh, pattern. But I'm really, really um, unsure this is the case. I think all of this looks random. But anyways, in order to find infrastructure, uh, this is how you can use it, and um, especially when it's been distributed something in the wild. Uh, keep something into account. Uh, actually, this happened to me the other day. Um, what happened to me is that when I was investigating something, I found that uh, well, there were like different artifacts in the same set of activity. Um, one of the tools was some, was some lateral movement tool. And in this case, the lateral movement tool was being downloaded from some server that was very public. Uh, what, it, what, what I mean is that, you know, if you have some kind, this was some kind of APT attack. So everything was distributed in, uh, well, you know, let's say professional way. And then suddenly you find this server, which was being used to download, like I think some Mimikatz or something. And actually, if you pivot through this uh, server, you will find a lot of stuff being distributed from this server. Uh, so what was happening here is that the attackers, they simply found that someone else was using this server to distribute some malware, generic malware. And they are like, well, you know what? We simply will use that. We will leverage that we have access to the server like everyone else on the internet. So we don't really need to set up any specific infrastructure for us. And this can be misleading for your investigation. Because if attackers are, you know, abusing some other attackers to get some of their artifacts and everything, this can be confusing. So just be careful with that when you are doing your investigations. All right. So infrastructure. And now I wanted to talk a, a little bit about BT Graph, which actually is something that we have already been seeing here, right? And actually, BT Graph, uh, I think is is great uh, in the sense that it's providing us with a very different way to do our investigations. Um, this is nothing new. You can use other tools like Palantir or Maltigo, which are also great. Uh, and here, well, um, it's the same principle. So again, when we talk about threat hunting, I think that uh, 
this is a very good way to start an investigation unless you have a huge amount of data. When you have a huge amount of data, you need to spend some time cleaning uh, everything. But uh, let's take a look into graphs. Um, so I have here some graphs. Actually, uh, you can also check from the community uh, some stuff. Um, let's check this one, some suspicious activity from APT41. Uh, I don't remember when I was taking a look into that, to be honest. But so we are starting here from some executable files and immediately we find a lot of similar stuff. Actually, this is like a cluster by itself. Um, there are like different clusters. Oh, sorry. We have here some of the infra. You see that infra is clean, so it's not tagged by any one small issues. Regarding the tags, well, we, we put like you know the flag of the country where the IP is geolocated, but this is not necessarily relevant in most of most of the cases. So well. Here, this is how a typical graph looks like when we drop a lot of information here, you know, like from some new investigation, we drop all the IOCs and this is how it looks like. So let's go for something more normal. Let's start with this investigation. Just to see the different components. All right, so here we go with this document. And sometimes it's simply to have, um, I don't know, the, 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 this canvas where you can simply see things in a more clear way, even if it's not really necessary for you to work. Like, let's say we have this one, right? So we, we see it's communicating, some domains, some IPs, very good. And here again, in the wild, we already uh, discussed about this. Uh, from here, we can probably find more of the infrastructure, but we don't find anything similar. Well, okay. And here we have all the contacted domains with normal issues. Um, in the wild IPs, well, we here have the URLs, but look at this. Uh, we have this bundle file inside. So, what is this? We can actually go check. So not surprisingly, this was a document. And from here, the bundle file is a BBA file. So we can simply go into content. And here we go. We have here like uh, the script that this is executing, right? And actually from here, Maybe, well, we can see it's suffocated and everything, but who knows, maybe somebody is using something similar here. Um, let's go check if with the name we can find some other stuff. Uh -huh. And here we immediately using one of the strings, we find like many other documents that are using the same technique for obfuscation. Uh, once again, it doesn't mean they are the same, obviously, but maybe they are using some similar obfuscation techniques because uh, we can find using this part of the... So obviously this is concatenating later. Uh, actually, the first part probably is concatenating differently in different macros. The names of the functions and everything, they will be different. So. But maybe we can search for something like that. But in content. It takes a bit more time. This is indexed in a different way. Oh, good. They still look like more similar for the time they were seen at the same time. Um, this one is newer. Let's take a, a look to the new one. So 
So this is obfuscated in a very different way. Um, uh, here we have the payload at the end. All right. I guess curious. Uh, let's take a look at this file. If we see any relationship. So this is the document it comes from. Uh, let's see more about this document. So it's contacting some JSP, interesting, so it's cool. Doc files and Microsoft root certificate authority, what is that? And it has some embedded URLs. Well, this is for the macro itself. Um, all right. It's a pity we don't have. Um, it's a pity we don't have like how it was distributed. Uh, let's take a look. I'm just curious about this file. Maybe we can see the content. Uh -huh. So you know what? Let's try to find something similar, visually similar, maybe. Aha, uh -huh. interesting. This notification that doc. showing. Ah, all right. So yeah, all of these, I wonder if they are related anyhow. Let's, let me check. Let, let me kill the previous graphs and everything. Uh, at the other day, we are just playing around here to get the idea. Interesting. So it looks like they are related based on the embed URLs. And this one is similar to this one. But embed URLs, they have in common, well, one of them is malicious, or at least tagged by someone as malicious. But I don't think it is. So etsy.org, what is that? Well, anyways, uh, I'm not sure they are truly related. Uh, at least these two, they look like because they are similar. And these two, they are similar as well. Uh, the relationships between them, I wonder what is this Etsy.org. But I'm not sure they are related. But well, this is interesting. So anyways, the, the goal here is to see how we can use this to quickly jump uh, into an investigation and visualize and use this kind of information to search for other stuff. So well, I, first of all, I think I'm eating you know, all my time. Uh, the demo, well, uh, we already did some demo here, so we don't need to do anything else. Ah, uh, yeah, this is interesting. Um, live hand modification, uh, notifications. Um, this is something actually we can do with the BT graph. Um, but I think we can talk later if we have some time just to make sure I can cover some of the stuff we already have pending. But just to say, uh, you know what? I will put live hand notifications later. I think it will make more sense. So let's go uh, because we only have nine minutes left. This is terrible. Um, for some tools for hunting. And the first thing I want to discuss is about Yara. Yara is one of the most powerful tools for hunting. Everything we've been doing now out of intuition and clicking here and there. Uh, in one Yara rule, we can condense all this information. We can create a more complex rule. We can make it more flexible. Uh, we can do it for detection. We can do it for uh, hunting. In this case, hunting is what we are more interested in. So. 
what we want to do with Yara is being able to create this rule where all this knowledge we have about some family stays in one place. Uh, we can simply throw this to find for new stuff, uh, which will be what we call retro hand. Basically, we go through all of our collection and we find uh, if there is any hit with the Yara's we just created, or we can throw them to monitor in what we call life hand. Basically, anything new that comes into the platform will we check against all the R rules if any of them is like uh, a hit we will receive a notification which is excellent for us to monitor and to understand if there is anything new so i hope everybody is familiar with your rules if you are not uh, i highly recommend this like one of the first steps for when you want to do some hunting actually this one is from uh, ncsc and this is detecting tool IPT and other than the reference metadata. You can see here, basically, we are searching for four very basic strings. Uh, you remember before we were talking about different strings that we can find. Well, here, our friends from NCSC, they were smart enough to find these four strings that are unique enough uh, to make a yard rule around them. The first one is not relevant because this is the magic which means that, uh, well, you know that all files, they have, uh, well, all, P, uh, all PE files, they have, not PE files, sorry, <laughs> all Windows files have these magic strings at the beginning, which help to the operating system to understand what kind of uh, file it's dealing with. So this is just saying, hey, this is a .NET file. And the rest are like these two infrastructure related strings. The th third one is the name of the malware, uh, how it is uh, written into this. And finally, they found a PDB, which is kind of uh, unusual. So basically in this rule, we're saying like, all right, um, well, actually this is a P and this is uh, .NET. And we want to find two of these strings inside of the Jara, uh, sorry, inside of the binary for the Jara to trigger. So we are simply finding something in terms of strings that is unique for this malware. And with this, we create a YARA rule and we can throw to find other stuff or to monitor. Uh, here I have a small demo. I, I think we are in time. I think this is interesting. Uh, just to show you how we can quickly create these YARA rules even if we don't have any knowledge. So this is a uh, Ryo example. Um, from here, uh, what we did, yes. Um, so this Ryo example, actually we can see it is matched by some ransomware uh, rules. So we are going to use this to find other files or so also find uh, found by these uh, cross-source error rules. But I think we were here, we have like 1000 files. Uh, this is Ryux ransomware. We want to find something fresher. Um, so actually I think I have here with a bit more modifiers, yes. Hold on a second, yes. So it's the same, all right? It's, we are searching for this Ryu ransomware, but first seen in the last two months, just to, to get some fresh samples. So from here, we find these samples, and how we can create a general rule out of this. Um, there is some technique. Uh, there are like, nowadays there are different tools doing this job for us. So one of them is what we call uh, BTT. And a PTD basically is getting all these files and trying to find what they have in common in terms of chunks of code. So the, the, the chunks of code that they have in common, then they are organized which ones are like the most common ones, uh, the most prevalent ones in, the, in our whole collection. So you can select the ones that are more unique in order to find this R rule, to create this R rule, just using this part that is unique for this bunch of files. So remember before we were discussing, hey, how can we find what is unique? How we can find this string? Uh, once again, this string at the end is a sequence of bytes. So we want to find this sequence of bytes that is unique for us to, to find some other files that could be related. Um, there are like uh, also some other Jira generators uh, like from Florian Roth, uh, Jargen, it works also very well. 
And in this case, it's more based on a strings, that sequence of bytes. But anyways, I want to show you all these tools that we can use as analysts nowadays. And there are many different providers for this kind of stuff. Uh, this is just one of them. So let me show you here we have how many bytes they match it and how many matches we have from our collection. Well, remember we have six files. So in this case, two out of six is not great. We want to find something a little bit uh, well, more common, right? Among all these files. So we are having this two out of six, two out of six, three. This one is five. Uh, maybe this is interesting. This one is five as well. So security function, it looks like interesting. Maybe is related to the uh, registry key, five out of six, five out of six as well. well. So we are basically selecting here a bunch of stuff that is common among these files. So what can we do with that? Uh, we can create a general rule actually. So we can from one side search from BT grep, uh, which means uh, I want to search if I find some more stuff. Uh, and so uh, using this search, um, using this search, uh, how many files I will find, right? This is useful just to quickly understand if we made a good selection, like if we find a lot, if we find nothing. But here uh, we can create a general rule, yes, out of these patterns that we found. And all of them maybe uh, is too much. Uh, we can do like four of them. Uh, we can call it like uh, the Oak Experimental uh, June 21. And I will get some notification, default corpus, and then I will send an email. I will get an email. So here we go with a retro hand job. And we will find uh, if this is getting something interesting for us. As I said, we can also do this live hand, so everything that comes new. Well, basically, with a bunch of clicks, uh, we can we can create something that is really difficult for an analyst without having the tool. So this kind of uh, generators for Yara, they are useful. But in my opinion, I will never recommend to create a Yara rule entirely based on that. I think that this is okay to start the, the investigation, it's okay to create something around this because it's very hard for an analyst to go and to search into the malware by himself and to find these files. But if we can create this Jara rule, like semi-automatically, and then we can put more conditions, we can polish a bit, this is okay. I think this is a good method to get it started. Um, I just have one minute left, so I just want to mention if you're interested in your rule, I recommend you to take a look into the BT module we have. Uh, why is that? Because basically, if you use the, this BT module, uh, basically you can translate all these searches with it into a YAR rule. Because with the BT module, you can query all the internal metadata we have in virus total. Like for instance, the behavior traits, how many times it was submitted, uh, the tags, and things like that. So I, I guess all of this will be shared with you later so you can take a look into the into my notes. Uh, just one word about IDA plugin. IDA plugin for VT is also helping you. And actually there is a new release that should be, I don't know, uh, now <laughs> or something like that, but probably during July. Um, basically, what you can do with that is inside of Ida Pro, you can search for some code that you find interesting. And then automatically, you can search for this in BT if you can find the same uh, chunk of code. Uh, why the, 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 the plugin is necessary, you may ask, is because it's killing all the parts that are dynamic and that are changing from sample to sample. So with this, you can simply search for the parts of the code that are static and that will stay. Uh, for instance, this is super useful when you are working with a memory dump or you want to find something inside a memory dump, which is different from the PE, but uh, automatically the search will be transformed just to the parts that are essential from this function. So it, it will help you big time to find stuff. All right, so actually uh, this will be uh, more or less everything I have for today. Sorry for the rush in the last minute, but uh, I hope that some of these ideas that we were discussing were useful. 
uh, how we can use like these new techniques in terms of threat hunting other than the more traditional ones. Uh, again, things like similarity, uh, visual investigations, uh, things like, um, well, Yara, obviously many different ways. This is stress on monitoring and different mistakes that we can make, and how to avoid them. I hope that more or less these ideas were useful for you, for everybody. But actually, I'm looking forward to check if you have some questions or comments uh, about everything uh, so we, I, I can help you solve. Uh, this one we already answered. And I see the chat. Oh, OK, there is nothing here. So well, then I hope it was not too killing. And, and what we were discussing today was interesting for everyone. So from my side, um, I don't know if you have any additional questions you can still type in the Q&A. Um, but if it is not the case, uh, well, uh, and yes, I just want to say thank you for everyone to joining us today in this session. Uh, it was uh, an honor for me to, to be here. And I hope uh, this is something useful for everyone. At the end of the day, this is what we want here, just to share some ideas and hopefully to help all the good guys to get protected and and to use some techniques for hunting. Uh, OK, thank you. All right, so in that case, thank you, everyone. Uh, don't hesitate to ping me if you need anything from my side. Uh, here you have my contact information here at the end. Just Twitter, well, that should be enough. Um, well, in that case, everybody have a good day. And thank you very much. <laughs>